speaker, Professor Mary Ann Lungsten from the University of Glasgow, who is also president of the International Menopause, uh, the International Menopause Society, and she is going to organize the next Congress in Vancouver in June 2018. So I hope you are, everybody will be there. Okay, well, thank you very much, Irene, and I hope everybody will be there too. And so I'm going to talk about perimenopausal bleeding. And uh, for those of you who were here at 8.30 this morning, feel free to check your emails, because the first bit is quite similar. Um, now, what I want to talk about, prevalence, investigation, classification, and then treatment, and I have no financial conflicts of interest, so that is the scope of the presentation. Now, heavy, me heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, abnormal uterine bleeding in the perimenopause is common, and it's common particularly between 40 and 50, and this is true in many different communities, not just in England. And the causes commonest anovulatory bleeding it's always the case in the extremes of life that this is what causes heavy and irregular cycles. The one everybody is most concerned about is endometrial carcinoma, and most women coming to, the to our clinics are terrified and sure that they should be organizing their funerals, and so one needs to dispel that as quickly as possible. Now, endometrial cancer is rare in premenopausal women, in under 50s, it's 0.4 per 100,000 women per year, and this is incredibly low. So the chance of a premenopausal woman having an endometrial cancer is low, but there may be issues with high-risk groups, particularly those on tamoxifen and those who are obese, and we see more and more and more obese women in our clinics. <coughs> When you take your history, remember the red light symptoms. And I think this is worth reiterating, even if you heard the talk this morning. Because you can pick up things like cervical cancer with intermenstrual bleeding. And for those of you who don't have a screening program, and who, where women have not had cervical smears, it is important to look at the cervix. And this often is omitted, and so diagnosis can be quite late. Postcoital bleeding, similar etiology in some instances. And then pelvic pain and pressure symptoms, rarely a sinister cause, but it may mean that uterine fibroids are more likely to be present. Now, palm coin, you saw uh, those of you who were here several times this morning, it's been very slow to be adopted, but actually it's incredibly useful when you're teaching medical students or trainees about the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding uh, at any stage of life, but I think particularly true in the perimenopause. And you've got your structural causes in the left, the palm causes, and your non-structural causes on the right-hand panel. Uh, which are the coin causes. And these are well illustrated, and uh, Matt Munro and Hilary Critchley have written very extensively on this, and uh, uh, Lucy Whitaker published a very nice review with them uh, quite recently in Human Reproduction. And you can see that the, the causes can all be identified, and the important thing is that all of them can be treated. And in the main, you'll treat structural causes with surgery of some sort, with some exceptions, and uh, the non-structural uh, with non-surgical treatments, again, with some exceptions. So, um, endometrial. I think we can possibly... Uh, we, we would obviously consider the hyperplasias in that, and um, the leiomyoma, the commonest structural cause. Adenomyosis, I'll mention a bit again in a minute. And so what we have is a new classification. The reason for this is that it became apparent when we actually talked 
to people from other countries and listen to what they had to say, that we all meant something different by menoragia and menometroragia and these other terms. And nobody quite knew what we were actually talking about. And I think the origin of the idea was actually from a research perspective. But it's now used clinically, and as I said, it's extremely useful when you're teaching. And so you have uh, your AUB coagulation, AUB ovulatory, etc. So you are able to describe the underlying pathology to somebody extremely quickly. Now, there are one or two things that are worth bearing in mind. We are trying to get rid of the term dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which is completely meaningless when you think about it, but has been very widely used. And certainly don't use menorrhagia, or people get very upset. But the other thing is, you might see something, but it may not be the cause. And sometimes the cause won't be seen. And so if things don't quite fit together, think beyond the obvious, otherwise you will miss things. And sometimes people do miss quite significant pathology because they're focusing on something else. The other thing is, and I'm going to go on to surgery, and just a, uh, on to um, treatments in just a, a, um, a minute, but the palm coin is very useful in defining the way you treat patients and you can go through your list, you can work out exactly what you need to do to get the best result. And please don't forget iron replacement. Many of these patients will be anemic or at least have low ferritins and benefit from some sort of iron. So investigations, we need to determine the cause. Ultrasound, first line diagnostic tool. Hysteroscopy as a support, and we use hysteroscopy extremely widely in an outpatient setting using mini hysteroscopy and vaginoscopy in many British clinics now and it's very widely accepted. It's not in all countries but certainly it is with us. And so when we're imaging you're looking for good ultrasound pictures, good clear pictures so you can really see what you're looking at, see the cavity, define the endometrial thickness, measure the endometrial thickness, make sure it's regular, and then you can do hysteroscopy and biopsy if you wish to. This is one I would undoubtedly hysteroscope. Uh, this happens to be a saline infusion um, picture, but uh, even if you just saw a thick endometrium, you'd want to look in with a hysteroscope so you can see what the problem is. The other thing you can do is MRI. Useful, very useful for multiple fibroids, and I still find it easier to diagnose adenomyosis on an MRI, and this is an adenomyosis uh, patient. Uh, many say you should be able to diagnose it on scan, but I think people must be better scanners than me, because quite often I find it really quite difficult to be sure, and you need a very high quality scanner. So I don't think we need to go into endometrial thickness, that's more for postmenopausal bleeding. But looking at hysteroscopy, yes, sometimes it can be uncomfortable and if a patient is distressed, you stop and you then admit them and do it under an anaesthetic. But otherwise you can often see the reason for the problem. For example, a fibroid, and here's another one. And so, you can make your diagnoses really quite easily. You don't actually even need to biopsy that to be sure that it is a fibroid that you have in your uterine cavity. Now, adverse events. You, ultrasound is actually very acceptable to patients and they don't find it painful. Some, some do, uh, but not usually in the perimenopausal period. But in the main, it is very, very well accepted, and it doesn't have significant complications. Hysteroscopy can do, and with the best will in the world, some patients will find it very painful, others distressing, and you will get the odd patient who faints, even if they haven't been particularly in pain or distressed, and these are the ones that take you by surprise. 
but you should be able to have a very clear diagnosis in one visit to the outpatients. We tend to do papel biopsies. We've usually done a hysteroscopy, and met, well, often we've done a hysteroscopy first, and so we're sure if we have a global problem or just a, a isolated problem, and then it is very useful. But it will fail. Sometimes it just isn't possible to get one. I don't know why, but it isn't. And um, you may not get an adequate sample. So, um, visualize. You can use scanning, you can use hysteroscopy, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both these modalities. So, I think you should be able to make a diagnosis with one stop. You need to have a tissue biopsy of whatever you can see, whether endometrium or something else, to make a final diagnosis. And so, um, hysteroscopy in the UK is being advocated far more, and some people advocate it on every patient. I think that's a bit over the top, but uh, certainly it's a, a, an attractive option for some. Now, when you found the cause of your problem, you want to treat it. And so, you may do this medically, and looking quickly through the various options, we've got our non-hormonal options, which will be well known to most of you. Very attractive, they're just taken during the menses, they don't interfere with pregnancy, although it's not that many who want to maintain fertility into their 40s, but some do, and so you have to bear that in mind. And so tranexamic acid, very useful, you need to take a regular dose, proper dose, three times a day during the heavy part of the period, or it does not work. And often you find patients who say, oh, it's no good. And the reason is they're not taking it properly. And so when the period is heavy, that is when you start. Side effects, minimal when taken this way. And so it's also useful for women who have heavy, regular periods, ideal way to treat, and you can use it while they're waiting other treatments, if need be. So, um, you, you might well also want to give the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, uh, methanamic acid is the one we use, again, it needs to be taken regularly during the periods, and it also is useful in dysmenorrhea. So you can often uh, give patients long-term or temporary relief. Now the other thing you can use, of course, are the hormonal treatments, but the ones that are effective are contraceptive, and this is without exception. There are the pill, which is really very useful, very effective, but there are the complications of the pill you all know about, such as um, venous thromboembolic disease. But it's, it's very, very useful, and you can run them back to back until breakthrough bleeding occurs. <coughs> Oral progestogens only work when they inhibit ovulation. You need to give them 21 days a month, giving them for less than that, and they may regulate the cycle, but they do not lessen the menstrual blood loss. So use them for at least 21 days. And then you've got your implants and injections, work pretty well, but about a third of the patients will have <coughs> irregular bleeding that will drive them completely nuts and may not get better. The answer to everybody, or the answer to all gynecological problems now, of course, is the Mirena, LNGIUS. Um, rivals are being produced to it. Extremely useful for treating heavy menstrual bleeding. In the UK, it's been the gold standard treatment for women without fibroids or just with little tiny fibroids. So we do use it very widely. Although there are quite a number of patients who say, no way, I don't want one of those, I don't want anything in my uterus, my friend had one and they didn't like it. So not acceptable to all. And so I think it's useful, the progestogens in the main are very useful, 
um, they're contraceptive, and this is an issue for perimenopausal women that is often forgotten. They feel that by the time they're in their late 40s, there is no chance of them becoming pregnant. That is completely wrong. And often pregnancy at this stage of life is a complete catastrophe for women. And so it really is important that they are aware of this and they have appropriate contraception. A couple of words about the selective progesterone receptor modulators. If you fail to hear any of the numerous talks that have been about it today, um, ulipristal acetate uh, has been trialled in several very well-designed um, placebo or randomised controlled trials of different type and um, is very effective, uh, both against placebo and against GnRH agonist and these have been published for some years now. And the critical thing with UPA is that it works very quickly. It works within a few days, and you don't have to wait for the three weeks or so before um, you get an effect as you do with a GnRH acnist. So it has some tremendous advantages. Disadvantages at the moment are that it's given in a cyclical way three months and then a two month break. So women have a period between each cycle to, to allow shedding of the endometrium. And I suspect this is quite important and trying to give off piste for more than <coughs> six months is not advisable or problems will be encountered as they have been with the other SPRMs. So I would urge people not to do it because we don't want problems with this, you know, these agents which are so good. Not so useful in women with submucous fibroids where irregular bleeding is common, but counselling will often help here. So um, the license is for over three centimetres because that's where the data lie, but there will be more data in those uh, with fibroids under three centimetres. So surgical means. Uh, at the time of the perimenopause, um, I think often people try and avoid surgery, but you've got endometrial ablation, you've got UAE for fibroid-associated bleeding, and you've got hysterectomy. Hysterectomy is obviously fantastically successful. It guarantees amenorrhea. It's great, but you do have a small but significant mortality these are data in women who did not have cancer. And so just bear it in mind, major complications in all the studies run consistency at about 3%. So there are problems, and so it is something that needs to be considered really pretty carefully. But the levels of satisfaction when it's done on the right patient at the right time are fantastically high. So really good option in some women Complications vary with type. The other thing is endometrial resection. This is an old picture of a resection. Uh, we used to do a lot of it in years gone by, and it's useful now when there are fibroids. If you remember back to the picture earlier, you can see how nicely this will cut out, uh, but I couldn't find the right slide. And so it should be considered in women with heavy bleeding, it can be done as a first line, really attractive option, but women must avoid pregnancy. Pregnancy after UAE is not a good thing because you may well end up with placenta accreta or some other rather adverse outcome. And useful with small fibroids, uh, with a normal uterus, and obviously with the second generation techniques which uh, are much more foolproof than the first generation where more skill was required with resection than it is with the second generation. Um, you can only do it in line with the manufacturer's instructions, so take care and make sure you do um, take, you know, you are following instructions on uterine size, etc. And they seem to come and go off the market with fair rapidity, so uh, it's a challenging area. And finally, just uterine artery embolization, really useful 
in women with fibroids who have heavy periods. Incredibly effective, massive decrease in menstrual blood loss for reasons that I still don't know and we've studied everything we could think of to try and find out. The effect on pregnancy is not so important in this instance um, and the chance of premature ovarian failure is about 5% in women in the perimenopause. It is extremely rare under 40, I should say. And so, um, useful in that it offers rapid recovery for most at a shorter stay, complication profiles similar to surgery, but equal quality of uh, life gain. But of course, there are more re-interventions than after surgery. So, well worth thinking about. I haven't mentioned myomectomy apart from hysteroscopic. There are no data to suggest that intramural myomectomy or subserosal has any impact on heavy menstrual bleeding, and I don't think they do. But obviously they can be done for other reasons. But there, there are ways of decreasing blood loss with fibroids, which may be very useful if you want to avoid hysterectomy. I don't think I can bear mention this again. I've mentioned it so often, but please come, <laughs> if you could bear to listen to us talking. But it'll only be once. Okay, so thank you very much. Do you want questions or is there no time? Oh, we will have two questions. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any question from the floor? Yes, please. Thank you, Madam, for a wonderful presentation. Actually, your white paper is a very useful. We have translated it and circulated it. So it is thank you for that. But now I am wondering that you have mentioned everything, but what about NHT? Is it an option for perimenopausal women who are bleeding and having the same time the time it is with us? Uh, yes, I probably should have mentioned that when talking about the pill. I think for women who have symptoms and irregular bleeding, then irregular period, should I say, rather than irregular bleeding, um, you could use MHT. I would probably do a biopsy first, um, although not necessarily. In, if they've come to the hospital for a hospital clinic, I might. But I suspect GPs may well start without one. The data are not as strong as with the pill, but it's certainly worth a try. Yes, I should have mentioned that as it's a session on menopause. My apologies. <laughs> One last question, please. Yes, please. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, speaking about pulling stars today, you showed two graphics, uh, one with 5 milligrams and another one with 10 milligrams. So my question is, do you have some experience using 10 milligrams strength here? Because maybe next year it will be approved in the United States, the 10 milligrams uh, presentation, but uh, not here yet. So well, we don't have five, um, we only have five milligrams available in the UK, and I think that's all that's marketed. I think that the data with 10 was not sufficiently better than five for them to use five. But more than, I think certainly one of the PEARL studies was with 10 milligrams. I think it was PEARL 3. And it seems very safe in the longer term, actually with the 10 as well as the five. Uh, but it may be that others know more than I do about that because I have no direct experience of 10 milligrams now. Thank you very much, Professor Dobson. It's my pleasure to invite our second speaker, Dr. Santiago Palacios from Madrid. Dr. Palacios has practically founded the menopausal medicine and has worked many years on menopause matters. I would like to invite him to talk us about the vaginal atrophy. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this city that we are in travels with Madrid and from Madrid. But I hope that everything will be running well, because I hope that our politicians will be clever. I don't know. Well, we are excited, we are worried, we are concerned. But well, this is the situation that we are. 
This is a pleasure to be here with all of you and to discuss a beautiful approach about one question, that is, if we trade early BVA, is much better that to wait? This is something that I am going to analyze with Ospemifen, one sharp, as you know one. This is my disclosure. As you know, all of the most important menopause societies, the International Menopause Society, the North American Menopause Society, the European one, accepted that the principles of the treatment for VBA, for vaginal atrophy, is to alleviate symptoms and restore vaginal physiology. No doubt that all of us, we agree with all of these principles of treatment. On the other hand, I'd like to introduce this term that is ready in UK, in Italy, in Spain, uh, Spenifen. This is a selective history receptor modulator. The real indication in Europe is there, is the treatment of moderate to severe symptomatic vulvar and vaginal atrophy in postmenopausal women who are not candidate for local uh, estrogens. This, in fact, the first non-hormonal oral product of CERN for this specific indication. There are a lot of papers, more than 32 papers. There are three large uh, efficacy studies, 12-week studies, and one safety year study. And the results are clear. The, this product in the three trials, they demonstrate clearly that they decrease the vaginal maturation in this, they decrease the pH, and of course, majorate all of the most, both the sun symptoms. No doubts about the efficacy of this germ in relation with vulvar vaginal atrophy. But let me to show something that it was the reason why I have this lecture here. Usually, when you are doing a phase three, for statistical reasons, we divide the symptoms in none, that is zero, mild, that is one, moderate, two, and severe, three. In other words, we say, well, symptoms mild and none means that this is nothing, this is alleviate or relief. But when we say that one step means only an improvement, when you treat the women and you pass from severe to moderate is one step, and you say that you improve the symptoms. But if you pass across from severe to mild, it's two steps, and we can define a substantial improvement. Why I say this? Because when you read a paper and they say, well, the improvement is 1.3. You say, what is 1.3? This means that this is more than one step. That means more than severe to moderate or to moderate to mild. And when, when we say that this is more than two, that means 2.1, for example, means that they cross from severe to mild, for example, or from moderate to none. This is important to understand. Because when we analyze the, the trial done with Bacelot, by with Ospemifen in BVA, we can see exactly this is like in terms of the most bothersome symptoms. In terms of improvement, only one step, we have around 75% of our women that they do it, exactly the same proportion that uh, local history, more or less. When we analyze, if you look the, in the end, exactly what's happened with substantial improvement. That means two steps, around 47, 50% of women, they have this exactly, these benefits, and in terms of relief, around 62. That means that, well, this is something clear in relation with uh, this, the first efficacy trial done with Ospemifen. But when we analyze not only the most bothersome symptoms, when we analyze all of the symptoms done in this publication, all of the DVA symptoms, we have exactly the same result. That means that while spending works very nice in improvement uh, in relation with 
with our patient, and around 75% of the patients they are going to have these benefits, and in terms of substantial improvement, around 50% of our women. But what? What is exactly the question that we decided to put on the table and to analyze with the trials uh, in our hands, the spermifen trials? It, of course, all of us will agree that the DVA is a chronic condition. It's a, not only a chronic condition, it's a progressive condition that is important too. And the, the impact of treatment delay can result in stenosis, vaginal stenosis. That means that this is something important to, to, to take into account and to analyze. For example, here you can see one the typical point, the, the example done by one of my colleagues, that women with 53 years old and without history and treatment, you can see what has happened here with kind of vagina ease, and women with more than 75 years old, 79, but with local history, is absolutely different the vagina. That means that, well, to trade is important in this concept. And we decided exactly to understand if trade women early, they can some or not benefit with, with a spermifen. The first thing that the first study that we analyzed was the 50,310 50, study. It was the first one for efficacy with a spermifen. And the conclusion was only in, in relation with improvement. Improvement only. That means only improvement, one step. If you compare what, what were the percentage of women that they improved, starting with moderate symptoms versus severe, were in terms of vaginal drainage, were exactly the same. With this union, were more or less, a little more in moderate, they have some benefits if you trade moderate more than severe, but more or less exactly the same. And with vulva vaginal irritation, was exactly more or less the same. No differences if you trade women with moderate to severe symptoms in terms of improvement, one step. What's happened in terms of uh, the second study that we analyzed, not the, fir the first one, the second one, in terms of efficacy, the results were absolutely the same, more or less equal, the benefits of the improvement, the percentage of women with the improvement, one step, as I said before, uh, in uh, relation with the vaginal dryness and dyspareunia. If you combine the both study, you can see this slide. That is exactly, you have the same benefits if you trade or you start trading moderate and severe women in terms of improvement on. In conclusion, we can summarize this part of the study. Does spermifen improve DVA symptoms regardless of severity at baseline? Exactly, you have the same result if you trade moderate to severe uh, symptomatic women. But move on to the most exciting issue here in relation with this uh, sub-analysis done in, in this trial. Uh, if you analyze, no, the improvement, if you analyze the relief, the relief of the symptoms does mean more than two steps. And in the first study, you can see exactly that if you trade women with moderate <coughs> symptoms, you are going to have absolutely 75% of the relief and absolutely higher than the severe women. And exactly the same with dyspareunia and vulvar and vaginal irritation. This means that if you trade women early, when they have moderate symptoms, you are going to relieve more percentage of women than if you wait until having severe symptoms. In the second study, the second efficacy study with the spermifen, we analyzed exactly the same. And with the vaginal dryness, the results were very similar, but not with dyspareunia. Again, if you trade moderate, moderate uh, women, you are going to have better result than if you trade women with severe dyspareunia. When you combine 
both study, the result are, is clear. Absolutely, we can say that if you train women, when they have moderate <laughs> symptoms, you are going to have absolutely a higher proportion of women that they are going to relieve. They are not going to have any symptoms, they are going to be very happy. This is something exciting, because as my knowledge is the first time that we analyze the VBA symptoms, the treatment of VBA symptoms early or after having moderate or severe symptoms. This is something very, very nice. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, after this sub-analysis of the trials that we have with the SPEMIFEN, we can say first that in terms of improvement, only one step improvement of EVA symptoms, well, the, the regardless of baseline severity is the same, that you can treat moderate or severe with the same proportion of women that they are going to improve, clearly. But in some way, when you like to relieve women, Early training with sensium, they are going to, to have better result, absolutely better result. In fact, we can finalize with these two beautiful sentences here that we therefore recommend it after this work or this sub analysis, early training, absolutely early training. Because for if you do this, you are going to have higher rate of cure, relief of symptoms, and of course you can prevent these sequelae of EVA. I think that this is something beautiful and beautiful recommendation after this super analysis. Thank you very much.